this interesting seminar. I'm Ian Forrester. I'm sitting in my house in Brussels, which is close to the Berlin Mall, close to where the negotiations uh, are continuing, I suppose. I don't hear any cheering in the street. And uh, I begin with a little anecdote reminding us of bizarrely where we are. In November 2016, I was asked to give a lecture to Glasgow University called the James Wood Lecture. And uh, originally it was going to be on a cheerful subject like Scottish law and European law or something of that sort. And then with the result of the referendum uh, in June of that year, uh, we had to um, alter the target. And uh, so I talked about Brexit and I said, well, um, Brexit is going to pre present us with enormous tasks in many, many fields. Um, but one area where we can be quite optimistic is that of competition, because we share a common, uh, won't say common rule book, I don't think the word existed then, but we say we share uh, common aspirations. That's to say the UK has a very well-respected agency and there should be no difficulty with respect to cooperation, state aid, that kind of thing. So that's one of the areas we don't really need to worry so much about. Well, um, four years later, uh, I think that I was not correct. And uh, to eliminate some of these problems, or at least to identify them, and maybe to speculate about the future, uh, we have a good assemblage of um, uh, real experts. And our first speaker, uh, is going to be Annalee Howard QC, who um, started life like all good young lawyers as a referendaire in Luxembourg and um, has, like everyone who passes through the court, flourished thereafter. And she is extremely busy in this particular field. She's going to talk now about what you might call the level playing field regulatory questions and, and um, standards, of course, and the notion of cooperation. Anneli, you're welcome. Please unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, I just have to make one correction that I'm not a QC. Um, I just have my, my plain name, but I think there's some slides that Daniel's gonna put up for me and hopefully the screen sharing will work. And I'm going to talk about the regulatory policy issues and the, the level playing field. And a lot of the uh, time people use this as sort of competition for shorthand. And um, as Sir Ian was saying, you, you might be thinking, well, why does competition law really have this much to do with the level playing field? Because the competition law position seems straightforward, or so we thought. And I want to try and dive into some of the issues that underpin these concerns between the negotiating parties and then present problems for businesses going forward. And these issues are not new. I mean, they've been around right since the beginning of the referendum. The most recent um, statement in July from David Frost, you can see that the issues are still, even nearly six months later, remain the same, where he identified that although there are, there are common interests to have some degree of cooperation in certain regulated sectors, there are other areas where the UK wants to maintain its sovereignty, it wants to maintain its regulatory autonomy so that it can set its own standards going forwards as a fully independent country. And if we just take a snapshot of where the um, EU Withdrawal Act leaves us, well, you might be thinking, well, what's the problem? Because we have this um, watershed of the 31st of December, 2020, where anything that's in force and operative up until the end of December this year will be cut and pasted into the skeleton of our own statute book. So we have effectively replicating EU law as we know it and converting it into EU retained law and that covers all regulations, all decisions, all 
uh, commission regulations, implementing regulations and guidance, and court of justice rulings. So that will actually be hardwired into our system. And the courts will continue to apply and interpret that law, applying the normal rules of, of um, EU construction. So where, where is the problem of, um, of uh, the level playing field? Well, there are two specific carve outs in relation to existing EU law in that Parliament will obviously retain the right to modify any of those provisions of European law after the event. And also in the light of the recent consultation that's been conducted, both the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court are now going to be free to depart from pre-existing Court of Justice rulings in exceptional circumstances where they see that it is appropriate and they give reasons for the departure. And obviously that's the situation up until the 31st of December, but then going forwards, there will be the risk of diversion, divergence. And that applies both at the EU level and on the domestic front, because it's very clear from the watershed that future EU developments are not being retained within the domestic system. So the courts may have regard to future EU commission policies, or may have regard to future rulings of the Court of Justice, but they're not bound to apply them. They're just relegated to a question of weight. And, um, and in so far as the court sees them to be at all relevant. So there's no, no binding um, or comfort that future EU standards will apply. And importantly, the EU, uh, the UK is very keen on preserving its autonomy to develop its own industrial policy going forwards. But as I'm going to show you, the, the carve out is actually that e UK companies will of course, if they're selling cross border and they want to have access to European markets, will have to comply not just with the UK rules of the brave new world in the UK, but also with the EU rules going forwards, however they might change and they will be subject to enforcement measures and potentially fines if they don't comply on the EU front. So let's have a look at the impact of the, where this is likely to hit different sectors of UK business. And this slide is taken with very kind permission from Evershed Sutherlands, who conducted a very useful report called Preparing for Brexit. And they've broken down a number of um, statistics of the extent to which companies in the UK are prepared for Brexit and in which sectors. And if you look at the second grid of this, you can see that um, over 60% of UK businesses um, import and export goods and services to and from the UK, from the EU, and 53% have their supply chain in another member state, and 82% of UK businesses consider that their businesses will be affected by Brexit with a five to one ratio of negative to positive outcomes. And if you look at those sectors that are likely to be affected, you can see that a lot of them apply in regulated sectors where there's a high degree of standards being issued by European bodies. So for example, there's construction, there's food, financial services, professional services, transport, energy, manufacturing. All of those key sectors of the, the standards that apply have been promulgated by European harmonization or European standards issued by, on a collective basis, by European decision-making bodies and agencies. So where, where, are the, where is the impasse between the UK and the EU. This is the next slide. And what I've done in this table is I've just tried to condense the negotiating positions of the UK and the EU taken from their published negotiating briefs earlier in the year. And you can immediately see the red lines and the clashes between them because the UK obviously wants to preserve its regulatory autonomy to set its own standards it doesn't want to commit to any dynamic alignment going forwards, particularly on the level playing field. It's prepared to give some commitments 
not to weaken labor environment or competition standards, but it is not prepared to have any real enforcement mechanism. It doesn't want that to be subject to any dispute resolution procedures in the agreement itself, simply wants it to go to, um, particularly for public procurement, to a WTO type arrangement. Whereas if we look on the other side of the, the EU side of the negotiations, well, they will only provide zero tariffs on condition that the UK commits to level playing field obligations. They want those obligations to be strong, legally binding guarantees with specific non-regression. That means the UK is not allowed to go backwards and undermine existing standards, but more, they also want to have dynamic alignment with future EU rules, particularly for state aid, climate change and food. And they want those standards backed up by a treaty enforcement mechanism in the agreement itself. So when you're looking at this and think, well, why, why is competition so in a level playing field so important? <clears throat> I'm not going to trespass into state aid because George Peretz is going to deal with that. But you can easily see that there, there could be potential dumping concerns if the UK is able to cut its labour standards or its environmental standards or um, its competition uh, pricing so that its goods and services are cheaper than goods that are produced in the EU, that would be an unfair advantage in terms of trading because they'd be able to undercut the European markets. And that's what the EU is concerned about, that if these standards of protection, which the EU sees as important for the internal market as a whole, if those are jettisoned, then it could give the, the UK um, a competitive advantage and it doesn't want to have UK businesses out competing EU. Mm. So let's, let's, let's just turn to the next slide and look at where regulatory cooperation is important because this is actually where a lot of standards are made. It's not made by harmonizing legislation. It's actually made in committees um, across specialist regulators. So for telecoms, you will have bodies like Berwick or you will have the EMA for pharmaceuticals, or you will have EASA for aviation, who, where you have representatives from each <sighs> member state effectively cooking in the kitchen and devising the standards together. So it's a process of cooperation and co-decision bet between um, the experts in the field. And the UK is withdrawing from a lot of those um, agencies and bodies. There are some that it does want to remain party to, but it wants that to be at, a, um, at an arm's distance relationship between sovereign equals. It wants to have a series of separate, separate mini deals for financial services, aviation, road haulage, where, where it sees that in the UK's interests. By, by converse, the EU, wants to have one comprehensive deal that deals with all of these sectors together so that the UK cannot pick and choose and cherry pick mm -hmm. and, uh, and have its cake and eat it as the EU sees it. And it's only prepared to give uh, a unilateral equivalence for financial services by member state. And those declarations will be dependent on very close alignment in standards. There are some areas where the EU is not prepared to let the UK have any access in, in terms of road haulage, electricity and gas, or audiovisual. And so this, this does create a problem because the UK, if it does want to have market access in these areas, it um, will either have to accept alignment to some degree or it's going to have some strange third party observer status to these bodies where it doesn't have any actual rights or votes or decision making power, but simply has to accept the terms that have been reached by its European neighbors. So that again runs up against the sovereignty agenda. So we wait to see 
if we are going to get a deal, whether there are going to be any continued cooperation in these regulatory sectors that are so important to ensure not just a level playing field across Europe, but also market access and uh, some form of, of passporting, even, even if it's not as extensive as the passporting that we've enjoyed for the last 40 years, at least having the right to access those markets uh, in the EU27 and the EEA states. So what does this mean for companies? On my last slide, obviously for companies that sell just internally within the UK, there shouldn't be too much of a problem because we're either gonna have retained EU law or our own version. The only problems will arise if there is a risk of goods going to Northern Ireland and then being sold on into the EU. Where you've got companies that are selling to, to European markets, then companies are gonna face a double set of regulatory standards. Now, the UK may have lower standards than the EU in particular areas. And in, th in that situation, the companies may be able to gold plate and they may be able to comply with the higher U EU standards, which will encompass the lower UK ones. The problem that will arise is where you have different and conflicting standards. Um, where it's very difficult to comply with both at the same time. And that may mean that companies either have to have different production lines for different markets, or they'll be faced with a conflict that is irresolvable unless there is some kind of um, mutual agreement, even on a bilateral basis between individual countries. But in terms of the companies involved, they're going to have to keep an eye on both sets of standards to make sure that they're <coughs> compliant and don't face any enforcement proceedings. So I'm going to, to stop there because I'm, I want to make sure that, that George and Michael can uh, lead on with state aid and procurement. Thank you. Many thanks, Annalie. Uh, that was an elegant, short, uh, accessible account of something which is extremely complicated and, and thank you for that. Now next we're going to have a colleague from Moncton Chambers, uh, George Peretz QC, who has um, made a particular specialty uh, in the field of uh, state aid and George is now going to review the tangled and potentially controversial field of uh, state aid. George. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, when I accepted uh, the proposal to do this talk, I had rather assumed that I would be talking about detailed uh, legal text. Uh, I'm not. I'm going to be reading uh, tea leaves, not text, because uh, the provisions of the uh, agreement on state aid are currently being negotiated. And as everyone knows, appear to be at the heart of the um, obstacles that remain uh, to reaching an agreement. Um, in many ways, the current situation is somewhat peculiar, given the UK's record as a member state of being a uh, vigorous champion of the state aid regime and a country that in general um, uh, was, was uh, not very often at the wrong end of commission enforcement uh, in the area of uh, state aid. Um, uh, in a article last month for the Neue Zeitschrift um, für Kartellrecht, Ulrich Soltes, the uh, eminent German state aid lawyer, uh, compared the United Kingdom's position to a sort of reverse road to Damascus conversion from Paul to Saul. Uh, and uh, that is uh, a comment that one could uh, fairly uh, make. Uh, there are, I think, sort of three sort of strands in the story uh, of um, uh, which get us to where we are now. Uh, there's an e UK strand, there's an EU strand, and I think a Northern Ireland strand. So I'll quickly say something about each of those, and then uh, some comments about what, peering through uh, the, um, the rather cloudy tea, uh, appears to be the sort of provision that's currently being uh, negotiated. So first of all, the, the UK strand, as I said a couple of minutes ago, uh, 
uh, the UK historically has not any had any particular problem with the state aid regime compared to uh, other uh, uh, EU uh, member states. And indeed, thinking back to only last year, 18 months ago, seems such an epoch, um, the then May government was proposing in the event of a no deal to carry on with the EU state aid regime more or less um, unchanged, simply substituting the Competition Markets Authority of the Commission and making a, a few other uh, minor changes and also as part of the Northern Ireland backstop agreed by that government um, to uh, sign up to a whole a complicated mechanism under which the whole of the UK would have been subject effectively to EU state aid uh, rules. Um, things have changed and they've changed notwithstanding the fact that the current government in the political declaration that it negotiated uh, and won an election on uh, last year committed itself to in that declaration to maintaining a robust uh, state aid uh, regime. Um, since the election, one saw a sort of steady um, change in the UK government's position. Uh, in March, uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Mr Gove, was still promising that there would be a robust state aid regime which would satisfy the EU. He said that to the EU Further Relations Committee in March uh, this year. And in June, uh, Bayes was telling us that it was working at pace on a new regime. Uh, well, the pace seems to have been, may have been pace, but like the Red Queen, lots of pace, it seemed to get nowhere. It was in September, the official policy of Bayes as announced on the 9th of September was that was not to have any policy for the time being, uh, but effectively to have a state aid regime, a sort of subsidy control regime, as and when the UK government felt like it, but, possibly, but certainly not before sometime next year, uh, if uh, ever. Um, and even in November, David Frost, the UK's chief negotiator, was still talking about an administrative regime, whatever that meant, uh, if there was to be a regime at all. The UK strand, um, one sees a sort of what might kindly be described as policy development over the period of the um, last uh, year. Um, however, there are, is a devolution issue and one can see that the government uh, retained some concern over that because of its efforts to put into the Internal Market Bill, a provision uh, struck up by the House of Lords, but still there, into the Internal Market Bill, a provision that made it clear that the um, Westminster would have power to impose a subsidy control regime uh, over the heads of the Scottish and Welsh Parliament if it uh, so decided. EU strand, um, it's probably worth um, the, the EU's concerns about having a very large uh, trading partner that was not bound by any subsidy control regime are well known. And uh, exhibit A is really the white paper that the EU published in July this year, which is not uh, certainly by no means solely aimed at the United Kingdom, although perhaps partly so. Uh, but that expressed in general terms a serious concern about the effect of foreign subsidi subsidies in the EU a concern that WTO um, uh, permitted uh, remedies were not enough um, because they didn't cover services and didn't help, for example, where EU-based subsidiaries of a foreign company benefited from that foreign company's uh, handouts from its own um, uh, uh, home state uh, and uh, suggested a whole package of remedies, including um, rather strikingly a remedy that would require the, a, a foreign company operating in the EU to disgorge the amount of the subsidy that it received from a foreign state and pay it to the EU. Um, so somewhat striking, and we can imagine um, quite what the Daily Mail might make of that if it happened to uh, a UK company. Interestingly, the White Paper made specifically made the point that where there was agreement with a foreign country about uh, subsidy control matters, that would be uh, the route that would be pursued first rather than any mechanism in the white paper. And that I suspect really was aimed at the UK. Northern Ireland strand, um, uh, article 10 of the Northern Ireland protocol, um, uh, uh, described by the government in its press release today as inadvertently creating a risk of reach back, that is to say of affecting subsidies primarily aimed at uh, Great Britain, but having an effect in Northern Ireland, 
perhaps because the company, uh, the great, the, the British company uh, had subsidiaries in Northern Ireland or because one could fairly sensibly see that the, there would be knock on effects from the subsidy into trade between Northern Ireland in goods and the rest of the EU. Uh, that um, inadvertent risk was one that almost everybody who knows anything about state aid warned the government about immediately the text became public. Um, after a rather lengthy period of silence from the government as to what it thought the provision that it had signed actually meant, um, one discovered really uh, when the internal market bill was published on the 9th of September, the government more or less accepted uh, what everyone had been telling it, that it would have um, potential reach back effect. And that was the whole rationale behind the controversial clauses that gave the government uh, unilateral power to, uh, in, to, to interpret or modify uh, Article 10, notwithstanding uh, its international law obligations under the withdrawal agreement uh, under Article 10. Um, the current, the press release, this is hot news, hot off the press, press release issued um, uh, this afternoon. The government has promised that it would, quote, deactivate, close quotes, uh, the relevant clauses of the uh, internal market bill. I mean, deactivate is slightly odd for, more appropriate for a bomb than a legal provision. I think they mean amend. Um, and the effect of what they say that it will be amended to do subject to agreement being reached in the joint committee that satisfies the government is a provision that merely allows the UK um, to, um, to, 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 to do things that are consistent with its international obligations. And I suspect that that is a reference to the safeguard uh, clause, uh, Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, that might conceivably in some extreme circumstances give the UK uh, some uh, wriggle room uh, in terms of modifying and in terms of um, not having to comply with uh, the state aid provisions of Article 10 in, 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 in fairly extraordinary uh, economic circumstance. But then, of course, uh, we are in a somewhat extraordinary economic circumstances. The point, so the point may not be entirely academic. So those are the three strands that have really brought us to where we are. Um, what appears to be being discussed um, is a a provision under which the UK would agree to have some form of subsidy control uh, regime um, that may be based on the WTO concept of subsidy, which is not vastly different from the EU co the concept of state aid. Um, anyone who thinks, for example, that the WTO's concept of subsidy doesn't apply to tax policy has another thing coming, it certainly does. Um, but it has the advantage, partly forensic advantage from the current government's point of view, of not uh, being a concept that comes from EU uh, law. Um, it sounds, looking through the crystal ball, as if the UK government has accepted there will be some form of regulator, although whether it, what, what its powers are remain to be seen. Um, and one assumes that the regulator will, will be the Competition and Markets Authority that OK is going to be talking about uh, later. Um, the, as, according to a, uh, an, an article by the almost always reliable Tony Connolly of RTE um, uh, yesterday, the current sticking points on this are, first of all, the question of whether there should be third party rights in court in cases where the regulator doesn't act. Um, in my view, that's perhaps not a hill that the EU should die in, die on, but in practice, the most important right for third parties is the right to be able to get in front of a regulator, to get a regulator to look at a complaint, uh, and the right to challenge a regulator if it inappropriately fails to take action or clears a subsidy if it shouldn't have been uh, cleared. The right to damages, the separate right that exists in EU law, is certainly, it's a factor, but um, it's only my experience of advising government is that one tends to assume that the obstacles of, that the lie between um, a state aid claimant and uh, a damages award are in most cases pretty pretty high, and there have been very few cases where damages have actually been awarded. The, the really valuable right for a third party is the right to get in front of a regulator and get it to move. Um, on the other hand, the UK government, if Tony Connolly is right, appears to be uh, uh, dying on the hill of whether there should be a, an ex ante requirement to notify a subsidy before it's granted. Um, that, again, does not seem to me to be a hill which it's sensible to die on. 
Um, for a start, most I mean, the EU is bound to accept that there should be a, some form of block exemption regime par parallel to its own, which will allow almost the vast majority of subsidies to, to be Im implemented and awarded without any um, notification because you just satisfy the block exemption. In cases where the block exemptions don't apply, however, it seems to me that in those cases, almost any well-advised recipient is almost certainly going to say that they're not prepared to accept and go ahead with a project involving a significant amount of subsidy um, if they haven't got a sign-off from the regulator, at least in any case where the regulator has powers to reverse the transaction to order the aid to be repaid. And a regime that where the regulator doesn't even have that power, where the regulator is no more than a toothless commentator, is I think one that would not be acceptable to the EU um, uh, and, and is probably, I assume, is not being uh, discussed. Um, we will actually, we will have to see, we hope in a couple of days, what the regime uh, looks like. But if Tony is right as to what the issues that are uh, remaining are, it seems to me that both parties might want to look rather carefully at whether they're really that important um, and certainly whether they're important enough to justify not having a free trade agreement with all the benefits that that will bring, particularly on the United Kingdom side. Um, so uh, having said all of that, I will hand over to, um, I think Michael Bauscher is next. Indeed, yes. Uh, Michael, you are very welcome. You have the most legal looking set of law reports behind you. That's um, always reassuring and uh, Michael is another of the team um, very specialized in, the, um, in this area. And uh, he is going to be talking particularly about his almost personal specialty, which is uh, public procurement. Uh, Michael, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Lovely. Great. Yes, yes, yes. Super, Thank nice you. to see you. Good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, George was reading tea leaves, but at least he had something concrete he could hold in his hands. I'm simply trying to discern a problem that is emerging from the mist. Um, but it is a serious level playing field problem. Um, <clears throat> at the outset of the negotiations, the UK rather resolutely refused to really put very much about public procurement in its mandate at all. Um, and notably very, very much less in its mandate vis-a-vis -vis the EU than the rather lengthy uh, analysis of the public procurement issues in the mandate vis-a-vis um, -vis the US, uh, which went on about the problem in some detail. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, it was clear that from the EU that it all, the EU always saw public procurement as a, as a, prob as a level play playing field problem. Um, since then, it's not. This is not a problem that's emerged much in the in the sort of the public side of the discussions, and and, and I, it doesn't seem to have been a stumbling block. It may very well be it's a stumbling block for the future, uh, but at least one way, of course, it's been capable of being sort of parked, is by simply adopting the the UK adopting the position that it that it will uh, sign up to the GPA. And indeed, last week, the UK did ratify its membership of the government procurement agreement under the WTO. Um, on the basis, I understand of coverage schedules that will look like its current coverage schedules, although they haven't been published yet. Um, and as those of you, anyone who's been involved in this sort of material will know, the battle over coverage schedules is where the, where the real guts and glory comes in, in these discussions. Um, but um, we'll, see, we'll, we'll see where that turns out. But why does any of this matter? Well, um, of course, it, it matters not least because um, according to the conclusions of the EU Council from uh, two weeks ago, 25th November, um, public procurement is going to be one of the main tools it, the, the EU is going to use to reinvigorate the economy. It produced Council conclusions entitled Public Investment Through Public Procurement, Sustainable Recovery and Reboosting of a Resilient EU Economy. Uh, the conclusions are quite lengthy and fairly naked in, in, two, in two respects. Firstly, that uh, the EU intends to use the 14% of GDP that is tied up in investment in public procurement as a tool of industrial policy. 
pretty it's pretty clear, clear and that the eu is going to use whatever flexibilities it can and will explore what flexibilities it can to um well, I'll, use, I'll use the phrase "get around." I'm not quite sure what 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 the the, the the wise draftsman in the council will use. They'd find another another more elegant word, I'm sure. But to get around the constraints imposed upon them by the GPA, because there's a lot of language about exploring the possibilities of of using the, using procurement outside the 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 tightest regime, exploring the poss the benefits of the internal market where no cross border interest is established, and so on and so forth. So we can expect to see some quite radical developments, really, and it's and it it may come across, it may come upon us a, a bit as a bit of a surprise. We it's easy to forget how completely baked into the public procurement regime is the internal market driver. The, you know the reason why the EU felt it necessary to put public procurement at the head of at the head of its legislative agenda back in the 1992 program was because of the perception that public procurement was an important way in which member states and regional governments would undermine the internal market and and seek to to unbalance the level playing field and um, in the happy days when the commission used to be a keen enforcer of public procurement um, virtue there were loads of cases about all sorts of indirect discrimination uh, features um, which have really been internalized certainly in the uk in the public procurement community as a, a means of ensuring the most open possible market in public procurement um, george has already uh, referred to the um, foreign subsidies white paper and on the EU side, although that that paper probably wasn't initially directed at the UK, it certainly, by a glancing blow, has an important effect on it. Module three of the foreign subsidies paper is explicitly directed at public procurement and at entities that are bidding for public contracts in the EU um, benefiting from some form of foreign subsidy. Now, I spoke at another seminar last week on, on the, the detail of this. I'm not going to go into the detail now, but there, this is a, a, an area that it seems to be fraught with difficulty. It's, it's to some extent the recooking of, of, of various issues which have been knocking around in various draft bits of draft legislation for nearly 10 years. Um, and of course, at the outset, the UK and its gallant band of allies were manning the barricades to repel that sort of legislation. Um, to maintain the open market. As George says, um, it's interesting that now, of course, the UK's left and many of, uh, many of its uh, the, the, the gallant comrades have left the barricades and joined the other side. And it may well be that the UK ends up being on the wrong end of this particular um, new policy if it ever gets into legislation. I think it will, there are a number of practical reasons why I think the UK was always right to, to vote it down, to get rid of it, not just on trade grounds, but also on efficiency grounds. But I'm not going to go into those now. Suffice it to say that this whole issue is difficult and problematic. The question also as to what, <clears throat> what sort of flexibilities might be found to use procurement in a more activist way is intriguing. Um, plainly, from the council conclusions I've already mentioned, there's an intent to look at how procurement of light regime services might be used in a way that is more instrumental through in, for industrial policy purposes. And it's quite interesting to map, while, while Annalee had the list of affected industries, I, up, I, I, I pulled up the schedule, th I'm sure all of you keep to, to, to hand, I pulled up schedule three of the public contracts regulations 2015 um, to compare the list of categories of service that fall outside the GPA um, and that therefore would be susceptible of a more directed um, approach by EU purchasers if they wanted to try and focus a more local based procurement policy. Um, there's an interesting, there are a number of areas where there's an interesting map across and you can see how particularly the UK with its large service economy might be very, very hard hit if contracts in this area were to be put, put, put dealt with on a more local basis. 
of course, the EU is far from being the only the only part side of this the equation dealing in this sort of um, uh, more instrumental use of public procurement for industrial policy purposes. Uh, we've had since the twenty twelve since twenty twelve the Public Services Social Value Act, which I think is some of the more traditional procurement minds in Brussels found rather horrifying when it first came out because it looked like. Um, an attempt to roll back a lot of the indirect discrimination case law. It's all about imposing on contracting authorities the at least the obligation to consider how to um, ben bring social value benefits to the local community. And we had this in September this year, the new pub procurement policy note from Cabinet Office, which strengthens that policy in central government and requires central government, the, 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 the in-scope bodies in central government to, um, to take account of social value in, in designing uh, public procurements. Um, so this is no longer you're obliged to consider, you're oblige, obliged to do it. And when you look at the table on the back of the sorts of things which authorities are required to do, again, these are the sorts of things that typically I might put into a problem that I would set to my students at the end of the year if I wanted to look for a nice little problem on indirect discrimination. Um, so it at least saves me writing and looking for examples in my exam for my summer exam next year. Um, the agenda for indi indirect discrimination is pretty nakedly being set all in, in terms of uh, future industrial policy. This, of course, is all going to be framed in the first place under uh, no doubt for the first the way of the UK legislation is, is set up we are there will no doubt be an overhaul of the of the of the legislation um, <clears throat> on a number of grounds but although the the government discussion paper whether it's green or white seems to be an, under debate um, is, is is already well delayed um, <clears throat> But as things currently stand, of course, any, at least with, for, for, for a contract falling within the GPA, and that would involve any, any contract falling within the coverage schedules, the relevant coverage schedules as between the EU and the UK, um, the GPA itself, as reflected in the regulations, Regulation 25, impose an obligation that a GPA provider be treated no less favourably than a non than, than than a domestic provider or an EU provider. If you're to, if if it's UK into EU and the other way around, if we're talking EU into UK, and at least until the end of next year, um, GPA providers so. All the EU providers will have the right to bring an action in the UK courts or in the English courts under the English regulations. I haven't, I apologise, and I have not checked what the position is in the amendment provision for the Scottish regulations. It's probably not the same. Um, but in the English, regu English and Northern Irish regulations, at least, the rights of an EU ch based challenger, which has no UK based, would seem to expire at the moment at the end of next year. Presumably, they're going to be put in, replaced by some sort of more coherent GPA remedy. So there are a number of odd sort of procedural problems as to how um, the existing domestic remedies are going to be used. Um, I suspect, though, that we're going to, if we're going to see an increasing amount of sort of subtle indirect discrimination, we may end up wanting to see a more active process in both directions of monitoring how people are excluded. And in doing so, we'll end up also having to look at what the law really means. And one of the oddities, which I, I think we'll get, we're going to have to explore at some point, is how what the test for discrimination now is. And this isn't just a question in the UK of what EU retained law means, because under Regulation 18 of the Public Contracts Regulations and its analogues in other provis provisions, we have a, an express provision that bidders shall be treated in a manner consistent with equal treatment and transparency and not subject to discrimination. Now, I think up until now, we've probably treated not, not subject to discrimination as, as a sort of shorthand, rather superfluous shorthand for not an infringement of EU law. Well, that my falls away. So does the, does the reference to discrimination or non-discrimination mean that we're referring to GPA law? Well, there almost is no GPA law because there have been hardly ever, ever any 
WTO case is about infringement of GPA on these grounds, maybe half a dozen if, if that. So we're going to have to try and examine what, what it means, what, what the, the obligation not to discriminate means and how far that goes into indirect discrimination practices in public procurement um, and what sort of protections as a matter of substance the law actually provides for. So anyway, I've gone on too long. Let me uh, let me pass on. All to say that uh, the battle lines have barely even been drawn, but there is coming out of the woods uh, an army of possible problems. Um, those of us who are practicing lawyers will smile and um, light a candle uh, for um, the prevalence of anticipated severe problems. Um, and those of us who are citizens may lament them. Now, you've heard three extraordinarily good and extraordinarily accessible presentations on three different aspects of the competition problem. And now we have um, Oki Odudu from uh, Cambridge, who is going to talk about the role of the CMA in pursuing competition, entre guillemets, after Brexit. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to uh, speak about the Competition and Markets Authority and hope to tie together the earlier three presentations. So um, the benefit of the withdrawal agreement is that after um, Brexit, um, but during transition, the competition law landscape has remained um, as it always was. Um, and so what we have is the Competition and Markets Authority as the competition body within the United Kingdom, applying and continuing to apply um, two provisions of the treaty, Article 1 and uh, 101 and 102, um, domestic competition law, the chapter one and chapter two prohibitions came contained within the Competition Act of 98, domestic merger control regimes to the extent it applies under the Enterprise Act, but also the market investigations regimes, conducting market studies, carrying out um, criminal cartel investigations, hearing regulatory appeals, performing its consumer protection function and carrying out competition advocacy. Now, in order to uh, carry out this uh, not insubstantial list of functions, in 2015, the CMA was operating on a budget of 65 million pounds annually. At the end of transition, the CMA will cease to be applying EU competition provisions. It will continue to apply the domestic competition provisions. There will be a range of amendments uh, to those provisions, um, merely to give flexibility and freedom in how they are interpreted and enforced, um, given that the need to ensure compatibility with EU law no longer exists. But in addition to its existing functions, it is also um, going to get, or likely to get, new functions. It will be the home for the new Office of the Internal Market. It will be the home for the new Digital Markets Unit. It will, as uh, George uh, mentioned earlier, likely be the home for any state age regulator. And even if it is not the home of a... Um, substantive procurement enforcement agency, it will certainly take procurement under its wing when it does its competition advocacy work. And so what we have is a, a competition authority with a range of existing powers, which is going to gain a whole raft of new powers. Um, in order to uh, conduct these uh, new functions, it had been allocated just at the end of November, a new operating budget, which is now just shy of 110 million pounds. So that, that substantial increase in budget 
gives you an indication of how much additional work it is uh, intended to be conducting. It's not only that the work that the CMA is doing is increasing, its current work will also become more complex. And there are really two reasons well known for this change in complexity. The first is, of course, that uh, the larger, uh, more complex cases often involve firms operating in multiple jurisdictions. So although they have an impact within the UK, they also have an EU impact. And so they are currently uh, being investigated in, by the European Commission. Um, at the end of transition, the European Commission will stop looking at the impact um, conduct has on the UK, and it will be for the CMA to look at that impact using its domestic powers. Also well known is merger jurisdiction. The existing regime grants exclusive competence to the European Commission in relation to uh, a number of transactions that fall within its jurisdiction. Um, but this will cease to be so at the end of transition. The way that the um, CMA takes on these new powers is set out in um, guidance it recently published um, on its functions at the end of transition. But in addition to these two changes that it has an existing workload which is becoming more complex and it is also being given more tasks, the CMA of course wishes to set its own agenda. That of course is its whole uh, or the whole point of uh, Brexit. In its annual plan which it published last week, it thus sets out its agenda that it wishes to continue uh, its leading work in protecting Consumer work at consumers and driving a recovery, but it also wishes to take its place in the global and or as a global competition and consumer authority. It has an ambitious agenda in digital markets and it has an ambitious agenda in the transition to a global economy. So it has an existing workload. Um, which is going to become more complex. It has a new uh, sphere of competence and it also wishes to set its own objectives. At the moment, it's clear that the CMA is already busy even before it takes on its workload. It's already, do, it's got 10 enforcement cases running. It's got 10 consumer cases running. It's got 22 merger cases running. It's got a market investigation and a market study under review. It's got a regulator appeal underway and 14 of its projects are currently subject to litigation. And so it is certainly not going to become less busy. Um, at the same time, um, whilst it wishes to set its own agenda, it's clear that it cannot set its own agenda on its own. Um, in September, it uh, signed cooperation uh, agreements with Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and the Department of Justice. And in its um, annual plan, it clearly sets out the need to cooperate um, with international partners. So it emphasizes that whilst it's leaving the ECN, it uh, intends to play a full role within the OECD the ICN and existing UN trade forum with competition remit. So it does seek to project its powers, but um, in relation to the ability to set an agenda, it's aware that you need uh, partners to be able to do that. It has a, the, the final uh, item on its agenda is its need for legislative reform. At the start of the year, it said that it was already doing all it can with its existing powers. It has called for new legislation. 
it wants that legislation to enable it to take stronger action more swiftly and more flexibly, which, um, as I would summarise it, seemed to me without interference of courts or tribunals. Um, and so we have perhaps uh, one of the most trusted authorities gaining a whole range of new powers at a time when the economic landscape is, well, I suppose, I suppose to be, is about to be remapped. Ian, back to you. Thank you very much. I very much like the, the last line there. A trusted authority getting new powers when the economic landscape is going to be remapped. Um, very, very interesting. Now, I've got um, five questions uh, and probably more will come. Uh, the first couple, and I'm going to join them, uh, are for George. Um, two, uh, yeah, two questions. Uh, first, uh, what sorts of funding uh, by the state are being considered, do we know, by HMG, uh, which would be forbidden under uh, EU state aid rules? And uh, related question, which is quite punctuel, um, are the regulations on state aid uh, going to be adopted uh, as, so to speak, threatened uh, with effect from January 1? George. Well, I think the answer to Alex's question is, uh, put very shortly, good question. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, anything that can be described as analysis, whether rigorous or otherwise, um, of precisely what it is that the current government would like to subsidize, but feels that either EU state aid law or any robust subsidy regime agreed with the EU uh, would stop it subsidizing, that it actually wants to subsidize. Um, so I think, <laughs> I think there's much more to say about that. There just isn't anything very mm -hmm. clear. And, uh, people have talked about subsidising um, in response to the COVID crisis, but of course uh, the EU Commission has, has allowed member states to um, subsidise an awful lot in relation to uh, COVID, and it's not entirely clear that the UK would want to do anything the Commission wouldn't allow, let alone a UK regulator. Um, on uh, Graham's question about the fate of the, um, the, the the revocation regulations, I mean those regulations are needed under the Withdrawal Act because um, absent any action at all by the UK government, um, the position on the first of January uh, and further on would be that Article 183 of the Treaty of the Functioning on the European Union, which is currently direct, which is directly effective EU law. Would remain in force in the UK because it's it would be retained EU law. That result is patently absurd because Article 108 3 makes absolutely no sense at all outside the outside the EU framework. It's an obligation to notify the Commission, an obligation that the UK would simply be unable to fulfil, leaving aside Article 10, uh, once it's no longer a member state. Um, so clearly, something has to be done. The regulations just get rid of it. There's an interesting question as to whether they're within the powers of the Withdrawal Act. Um, one of the, uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of necessary modification, um, one of the commitments made by the government at the time was that major changes in policy would not be done by the statutory instrument under the Withdrawal Act, but would be done by primary legislation. Well, this, however one looks at it, is a major change in policy, and yet it's being done. So I think this question about power is, I mean, there is an interesting, if there is a deal, and it includes a subsidy um, regime, there's a real question about whether any different UK subsidy regime could possibly, well, I mean, I think it's no real question really, it could not be ready by the 31st of December. Um, you, it will take at least six months to a year to develop a new regime. In the interim, there has to be something, the EU will insist on it. There will be no alternative. Yeah carry on with the current EU state aid regime in some form. And I think they'll probably dust off the 
old May government statutory instrument um, and uh, pretend it's theirs and use it to plug the gap. I don't really see much alternative. And that leads into an interesting question from Eric White, uh, formerly of the Legal Service of the Commission and a veteran of battles in Geneva. Um, and he observes more or less that agreeing the applicable rules in this field is one thing, but then by what procedural mechanism uh, shall disagreements about how the uh, relevant rule is to be uh, applied in a particular case. In other words, we have, we, we do have agreement on the substantive rule, but then we have disagreement as to whether the rule is violated. Um, who is the right person to talk about that? Um, I can talk about it if you like, Ian. Yes, please. So, I mean, again, if you go back to that table that I presented of the, the negotiating positions, you can see the UK is pushing very much for a WTO style um, arbitral system for dispute resolution, whereas the EU wants a very specific tribunal within the terms of the agreement itself. And, you know, the, the failings of the WTO system are well documented. Um, it's, you know, a very conciliatory political approach with a laborious um, Co cooperation regime that takes time. You then have a referral to the arbitral tribunal. And, and for, for many years, the WTO process has been held up because the US have not been willing to participate. Now that may change with the, the new president, but um, even when you get um, a ruling from the arbitral tribunal, the sanctions process is, is rather random in that the, the sanctions can be retaliatory and don't necessarily match the breach. They can be imposed wherever across um, different sectors of the, of the industry uh, and uh, not necessarily proportionate or, um, or linked to the underlying breach. And it's those frustrations, I think, which have led the EU to, for their recent demand, which the UK are, are crying as foul play, to seek to impose what are called lightning strikes so that if there is a breach by the UK or if the UK fails to adapt dynamically to EU standards going forwards, the EU can retaliate quickly with lightning sanctions um, to try and bring the UK to heel. And the, and the UK is saying, well, this is very much a last minute intervention by the EU. It's probably been prompted by levels of distrust because of the internal market bill, lack of confidence in the UK's um, ability to comply with international law. But it's not clear if those lightning strikes would be reciprocal, giving the UK right to retaliate if there was a breach by a, a government, um, by another yeah. EU state. I think the, the critical point as well is obviously those are interstate disputes, which are going to be fraught with difficulty. Obviously individual disputes are going to be difficult as well because there will be no direct effect, no individual rights. And the Withdrawal Act itself is very clear that there is no longer any right of Frankovich damages against the UK government. Likewise, it's going to be very difficult for individual companies and, and individual persons to bring actions against states, which are now governed by an interstate agreement, rather than one that has direct effect in the same way as the EU treaty. Okay, um, thank you. I'm conscious that time's passing. I've got a quickie well, it's not really a quickie, it could be a quickie for Michael. And it's from James Weber. And his question kind of chimes with my own feeling when I was on the bench, that this was a fantastic, uh, talking uh, public procurement. Um, the, the detailed nature of the rules was at times so tricky and intricate. It was more like a tax statute um, and principles you had to look for the principles. Uh, and the question was whether, um, well, so question to Michael, do you see if we're leaving the, the European Union's regime on procurement, is there a prospect of having a more principle-based set of rules? Michael. I would hope so, is the short answer. And and certainly that that is seems to be the idea um, behind or one of the ideas behind the current reform approach. I think 
plainly, I mean, you, the, the, the problem, of course, is because we are because we are now signed up to the GPA coming into force on the 1st of January, we're limited in, in how far we can depart. We can't, we can't go for a different model. The GPA, as you know, is a, is a model that is, reflects the EU model. So we're, we're stuck with the same overarching module, model, mm -hmm. but I'm sure we could redraft the legislation with about a quarter as many words and get away, and get away with a lot less pointless technicality. And we could probably focus on some really key areas, bringing out, and this would help in what I was talking about, you know, what, is, what does discrimination mean? What are the boundaries of a legitimate and illegitimate discrimination? After the whole point of this is to discriminate to some extent and also to go directly to the question as to how you how you undertake a correct correct decisions in the in the process of awarding ten awarding contracts and selecting tenders. At the moment there's tons and tons of verbiage about procedures but not, not a lot about what you do and this of course is, is a real concern in the, insofar as it, it, this sort of the, the, the compliance mentality which has grown up has created systems which may be good at, at demonstrating that you've done that you've not done something wrong but not actually any good at preventing a race to the bottom in quality for example thank you uh, two last very quick questions uh, one is for George Peretz I think there's been a recent High Court case on uh, Durham Council's uh, waste services and it was said there um, by our questioner that state aid cases are going to be null or irrelevant after January the 1st. Is that correct, George? Uh, I'm entirely happy to uh, answer it, although it was um, Michael Bauscher was, was in the case. He might ah. be happy to answer oh, dear. that. I didn't win. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's absolutely right on the basis of the current statutory instrument as proposed by the government. Um, if and when there is a free trade agreement containing a, as it will, some commitments on a subsidy regime, uh, it will no longer be true. But as of today, it, it's, it's, it's true subject to that condition. Okay. Michael, do you want to say anything very I'd quick on that? I, not at all. I'm very happy to defer to George on that, on that yeah. matter. Okay, and the last one, I'm not sure who this is for. Um, does anyone know, do, the question is, does the Northern Ireland Protocol only apply to trading goods? Um, yeah, because I, 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 I did tell them. I, the answer is yes, if you include electricity as well. It, 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 indeed, but on, on the, from a state aid perspective, one has you should have to bear in mind that an, uh, uh, an aid to a services provider, let's say for the sake of argument, a road, road haulage supplier, could have an effect on trade on goods because if it can supply its services very cheaply, that might help Northern Ireland good manufacturers and affect trade in goods. So, um, yes, that's right, but it doesn't mean that all aids to services are automatically outside the scope of Article 10. All right. I have the impression that we could be sitting here until the Brexit negotiations are concluded or until they break up tearfully. Uh, but um, our audience, which is nearly 200 people, um, uh, has been promised 60 minutes and some of them may be getting hungry or bored or threatening to leave or asking for their money back. Um, so with real regret, because I have been taking furious notes and learning myself since when you're on the bench, you're, you're cosseted and um, fed like a goose. Well, it's an unfortunate bird, but um, you are well fed with um, the relevant uh, legislation and applicable principles. Um, but uh, no longer is that the case for me, I'm afraid. So, uh, I've learned an enormous amount, and I think a lot of our uh, watchers will also have learned a lot. Um, the slides will be available, and I'd just like to thank Annalee, George, Michael, and Oki once more. This is really good, and uh, thanks to Cambridge for having set it up. So, ladies and gentlemen, bon appétit. Uh, thank you to those who've said nice things about us. No one has so far said anything nasty, but they're free to do so. And um, I hope that Cambridge can organize such a, an interesting uh, evening.
uh, event once we know what the people in the Burley Mall about 300 metres from here have agreed or have not agreed. So thank you for coming. Thank you for speaking to the four panellists and see you maybe soon. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Ian.